Thank you again for being here. So much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jamie, Mark, and this whole uh, Scrum Master of the Universe community for, for inviting me again. And I am so excited to share with you this topic that has become close to my heart, building resilience and developing habits to address stress, anxiety, and burnout. Today's conversation is going to be on, on a little personal level, and you'll soon see why. So as, as Jamie mentioned, uh, I am an agility and product leadership coach based in Tampa, Florida, and I run a little boutique coaching and consulting practice called PPL Coach, um, where I teach and coach and advise on strategies for arriving at better outcomes and supporting our collective well-being. So that's why this topic fits in pretty well there. But today I come to you not as an experienced agilist or coach, but as a human, sharing her very human experience. And my hope is that through sharing my experience and what I learned in the process, I hope for anyone of you who is on this session today or who might be listening to this recording into the in the future to know that if you are experiencing burnout, there is a path to restoring your spark and you will. And I hope that I make it a little more normal for us to speak about our brain health, just as we do our physical health. And lastly, I hope that we can develop the habits to skillfully manage stress, to help ourselves and to help others uh, who might be experiencing incredible stress and burnout. So, you know, I am going to do a lot of presenting today, but I just do not like it to be a one-way conversation. And I've become a huge fan of Mentimeter. So this will allow us to have some engagement and also be introvert friendly. So you don't have to be worried about going into a breakout room. Um, so I'm going to invite you to come join Mentimeter. So you can just join by either going to www.menti.com on any browser, or you can connect via your phone. You can just click on that, use that QR code. Uh, or again, on your phone, go to www.menti.com and enter the code 12946000. And once you're in, you'll be able to engage with any of the polls that I have in this presentation today, but also with every one of the slides. There's a little heart and a thumbs up and a thumbs down on every slide. And so you can share you know, what, what, what you're resonating with, uh, what you like, what you don't like, uh, and it'll give me a sense that you are all listening, uh, though I see many of you don't have your cameras on. And if you can have your cameras on, that will be an added gift to me because I'm, I'm a little nervous sharing my personal story with all of you and seeing your faces will help me dissipate a little bit of that nervousness. So if you're all there, I have my first question for you. These last two and a half years, what impact has it had on your levels of anxiety? Has it increased your level of anxiety, decreased, or has had no effect at all? Thank you. Thank you for sharing. I think we have most Anyone people who have responded. Anyone having trouble um, accessing Menti or, or anything like that, just reach out in the chat and Mark and I can help you out. So this is a slightly better statistic than the last time I presented something like this, where we had 85% of the respondents who said that they had an increased level of anxiety. Nobody, for nobody, it decreased their level of anxiety. And it looks like it's a pretty high percentage with this group as well. So let's look and see where the data that has been gathered around this correlates with this experience of this group here today. So here's some data from a survey that was conducted by the Kaiser Family Foundation in December of 2020. So imagine that very first year of our pandemic towards the end of that year. And here's what it's showing. We can see that the levels of anxiety and depressive disorder 
in our young adults was the highest of all of the various age groups. And then if you look at the gender, the various genders in every single age group, women reported higher levels of anxiety by 20 points. Uh, you can imagine that this is something as a woman and a mother of a young person, uh, it was a little distressing. And here's a report that came out just yesterday, the State of Workplace Burnout Report for 2023. And what it's showing is that this same trend is actually growing. And young people and women continue to have the highest impact, but it does not escape any demographic. Every age group reported higher levels of stress and anxiety and burnout, and then didn't, didn't uh, uh, you know, there was no industry, there was no role in any organization that, that had a uh, different outcome. And our organizations are beginning to realize that burnout is a clear and present danger and threat, according to this report. And you can see that that's, you can see that as, as being very, very uh, evident in this data. My sense is that you cannot pour from an empty cup. And the number of empty cups in our organization is increasing. My personal assessment is that languishing, quiet quitting, the great reclamation, the great resignation, the great reshuffle, they're all really responses of the same thing. We don't know how to respond to these increased levels of anxiety, stress, and burnout. And that's in ways in which they are manifesting. And I believe if we want healthy organizations where people can grow and thrive, which many of us as scrum masters and coaches, that's what we're trying to do. We must focus on our well-being first. So I'm curious, what increases your level of anxiety? So again, in Menti, you can check all of the all that apply. Uh, maybe we'd just check the top ones that apply because I'm sure that to some extent, Every one of these will probably level, raise our level of stress and anxiety. Anjali, how would you like to handle questions? Do you want people to just put it in the chat and ask at the end or do you want yeah, to- Yeah, actually, I should, I, if there's a question that, that comes up that's directly relevant to what we're talking about, mm -hmm. we can take those. Okay. Uh, we had one from Dana on, oh, um, a, on a the data. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very interesting about the data and this correlation with working from home and burnout. I had not really seen anything around that in the past, but this report actually showed the uh, there's a there's some data related to and what they the what people reported in terms of burnout and well being. So whether they worked from home 100% of the time, whether it was hybrid or whether they worked in the office, and it seemed like hybrid had the best outcomes in terms of burnout and well being. Not hugely different from the other two, but there's definitely there was a uh, a, a difference. So, and it might be something that can influence how we redesign our work environments. But I'll put a link to that study so you can, it does a lot of really good information in there that you can take a look at yourselves. All right. So, based on what is happening with this group here, lack of control, increase in uncertainty and unpredictability, loss of stability and disruption, and lack of knowledge. Uh, and context are things that kind of trigger and raise our anxiety and stress. But there's stuff that's happening in all of these different areas. And a couple of you mentioned other, so I must have missed some stuff here. So would you like to either share in the chat or unmute yourself and maybe give us, a, enlighten us a little bit with some other things that cause stress for you? Uh, this is Dana Myers. I would say yeah. health issues whether it's yeah. personal or other family members. Yeah, yeah, 
Thank you for sharing that. Yes, our, our well-being, lack of well-being itself from our health perspective can contribute to stress and make matters worse. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. All right. So here's something that I came across a few years ago that kind of might explain what is going on for us right now. So this chart comes from the book, Thank You for Being Late by Thomas Friedman. And you'll see here, it basically has two, two lines. One is a, uh, 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 an exponential curve that's representing the rate of technological innovation, the rate of change of technology that we've been experiencing over the last several years. And then the black line represents our rate of human adaptability. And if you notice, we have crossed, those two lines have crossed. And that the rate of technological innovation is far, far exceeding the rate of our ability to adapt. Now, we all became familiar with this kind of curve during COVID. The rate of those the illnesses was increasing at a similar rate, an exponential rate. But this kind of curve, this kind of exponential curve is not just limited to technology and COVID. We are experiencing these kinds of curves with climate change, with population growth, with political and civil unrest, with the way in how much, how information is transferred and absorbed, globalization, all of them have similar exponential curves. And so we are at a point in time where the rate of change in multiple areas has crossed our rate of human adaptability and this gap is growing. Our world today is ripe for those conditions that you all mentioned as triggers for stress and anxiety, insecurity, uncertainty, instability, lack of control. So I was one of those people in that statistic. I had experience of extreme stress and anxiety that led to burnout for me. This is my story. Early 2021, a few months, maybe nine months after the start of the pandemic, in the midst of my growing agile practice, I started experiencing some unfamiliar symptoms. You see, early 2020, the pandemic hit. And after that initial adrenaline rush of coping with what we thought initially was a three week event, and then a three month event. And I realized there was no immediate end in sight. And my temporary change in routine, which, you know, Jamie was part of that early experience of when we like figured out like, hey, let's go help everybody, you know, temporarily manage their remote work and let, you know, we created some online events and stuff like that. Well, that temporary thing uh, was really a longer term disruption. The future of my business was uncertain. And I started to question if that initial pause of my clients would turn into a full stop. And I felt I had little control, but I was determined to pivot, to make it work. I had to make it work. You know, I worked on getting a class accredited through IC Agile and became doubly committed to my existing clients. On the home front, things were also starting to build up. We were caring for an aging parent and I kind of felt guilty that I was not doing enough for her. My daughter, who had just graduated a few months earlier, lost her job just after three months of being in her first job, moved back in with us. Uh, and top of everything, we were moving to new accommodations. So need I say more for anybody who has experienced a move. My stress levels had gone unchecked. I just continued on. And that gap between the change that I was experiencing and my ability to adapt became a stark reality. In fact, the first time I spoke here at Scrum Masters of the Universe, when y'all invited me, I was starting to notice the symptoms. It was actually the last talk I gave that year. 
because after that, I couldn't say yes to much. So what was that experience? What was those feelings? Well, I initially thought I was just feeling the blues that led to starting to have a foggy mind. That foggy mind led to overwhelm, where even the smallest thing that anybody asked of me felt like a monumental task. As I had recovered from this, I wanted to write more about it and I used to journal and one day this poem came out of me. And so I'm gonna read it to you. It kind of captures the essence of what I was going through. My tank of emotion was empty, my well of creativity dry. My decision-making had gone blunt. There was no sparkle left in my eyes. Restless nights were filled with endless mind chatter, yet my brain felt devoid of oxygen. Tired days were beckoning sleep. Seemed like my motivation had gone on vacation. Every activity was like a trudge through mud. Every new request, a 20 pound weight added to an already unliftable dumbbell. The prickly sensation of anxiety covered every inch of my body. Simple joys were hard to come by. Nothing I did felt good enough. I could only meet my own disappointment with a sigh. These feelings were unfamiliar and scary. A free fall with nowhere to land. Do I keep this feeling a secret or is it okay to ask for a hand. I didn't know I could ask for a hand back then. It would be a completely different experience now that I know a little bit more. But there were people who came into my life that offered that hand. I learned that what I was experiencing was symptoms of burnout. Now I've since restored my spark, but in the process learned what causes burnout and that it is much more than overwork. That high achievers and high performers are equally susceptible and recovering and restoring from burnout takes a little more than a mental health day, a few long weekends or even a vacation. So, for the rest of today's session, I want to share with you what I learned about reversing the direction of that downward spiral and restoring my spark in the hopes that it'll help at least one other person. So today we're going to explore what is anxiety, what I learned about our brain's response to anxiety and stress, and some a resilience strategy, some habits that we can develop so that uh, we can help restore and perhaps never have to experience burnout. And I hope that you'll find it valuable too. So I wanna give a little disclaimer. I am not a trained medical professional and not a mental health expert. I am only an expert in my own experience. Please do not treat this as medical advice. If you feel any of these symptoms are debilitating, please go seek professional help. All right, so from a novice, here goes. What is anxiety? I have learned that our brain and our bodies are incredible. We have the ability to cope with stuff. And so what is anxiety? It's just a natural body's response to a challenge or a threat. And when we are faced with a challenge or threat, and this comes from our early survival instincts where in faced with a tiger or a lion in front of us, our body knew how to react. And what it does, it, it releases a bunch of chemicals, epinephrine, norepinephrine, adrenaline, adrenaline, cortisol. And this chemical release helps us gain that boost of energy that we need to get away from the threat. Now this boost of energy gone wild, leads to anxiety. That's as simple as that. 
So, and gone wild means we have not taken the chance to recover from that stress that we experienced. Ah, so let's see what's happening to our brain. I listened to a talk by this young woman, Du Quach, and she wrote a book called Calm Clarity. And what she explains, and I'm, I'm going to do a, uh, I know I'm going to do injustice to her work, but I want to just share with you a little bit of what she explained that helped me put, make sense of what I was experiencing and what might be happening in our brain. She talked about three primary brain patterns. Brain 1.0, which is our uh, self-preservation pattern. In this pattern, the amygdala, or the reptilian brain, that brain that you know is a survival instinct brain, is active, right? And brain, when brain 1.0 is, is triggered under these conditions, some disruption to lack to safety or security, or when there's uncertainty or the potential of negative future outcomes, or loss of control, helplessness or powerlessness over a situation. In these situations, the signal of the brain is saying, danger, danger, danger. This is a highly low trust situation here. This is likely to lead to a negative future. Time to fight or flee or freeze. And this is, like I said earlier, developed to protect us, you know, from things like tigers and alligators. And for us in Florida, alligators, I mean, yeah. And, uh, and, they continue to protect us from foreseeable danger. So that's one pattern. The second pattern of our brain is the activation of our reward circuitry. So this is kind of like the, she calls it brain 2.0. It is our reward and acquisition system. So this pattern is triggered when we have a situation that we deem really important or high stakes. We have a particular attachment to an outcome or desire for greater autonomy and freedom. And the goal here is achievement and praise. So this is our second, second uh, pattern. Just give me a second, lost my, lost my track here. <clears throat> and then there's the third pattern, brain 3.0. And this pattern of the brain is uh, looking for mastery and well-being. And it really puts the other two in check. Let me... So it, it, it kind of keeps the, the reward and survival circuits still, act, the, the reward and survival circuit, circuits in this case are still active. And here's the prefrontal cortex, the, the, the executive, where the executive functions live in our brain are able to help us discern, discern when the other circuits need activation. All right, now, with either prolonged or unmanaged stress, or loss of hope or purpose, we experience a syndrome called burnout. When we are in the state of burnout, there is a sense of hopelessness. Life kind of loses meaning and joy. Your interest and motivation dry up. You have a hard time meeting your professional obligations. Everything uh, you need to do feels unsurmountable. Now, the WHO has actually compiled the symptoms that we experience when we experience burnout. And you'll notice that from my story, these correlate. Here are the symptoms, increased negativity and cynicism. People kind of disconnect from their work and pe other people. So there's the detachment, alienation. Lower professional efficacy. And at this, in, in burnout, we are really have low resourcefulness and creativity, and that impacts the quality of our work. There's feelings of not good enough, lower confidence, and all of that just makes matters worse. <laughs> I came to believe that with this condition, we do half the work in twice the time, as opposed to what we look for in our agile world, twice the work in half the time, right? This is the exact opposite. 
And then feelings of exhaustion. So not just physical, but mental and emotional exhaustion as well. A good description of this is that you are bone tired, heart tired, soul tired. When this burnout has taken hold, your battery is dead or your cup is empty, or you can even think of it as if you have essentially run out of gas. And in fact, the ignition is broken too. It happens slowly and then suddenly. So it's, it's, it, it takes a long time to actually uh, manifest and then you experience it all of a sudden. At least that was my, my uh, condition and from what I've heard of a few other people as well. It can happen at any time to anyone in any industry at an any level of the organization. And it is not the fault of the individual, nor does it indicate weakness or incompetence. And I'm not just saying it because it happens to me. This is what we, we can uh, see from other reports as well. So I am very curious. Have you in this group experienced the symptoms of burnout as described in this previous uh, slide? Well, I hope that little of what I share today helps this 78% of you. And I'm glad that I uh, decided to, to talk about this. Here's what is happening <laughs> to our brains in terms of those patterns. Under unmanaged stress, the gray matter in our prefrontal cortex is thinned and its connection to the rest of our neural circuitry is weakened. The amygdala becomes hyperactive. In other words, our brain 3.0 pattern is diminished and our brain 1.0 pattern is strengthened. And so in order to be able to manage stress well and to be able to avoid burnout, our goal is to see how we can keep the brain 3.0 pattern that allows us to have uh, balance and discernment. We need to keep that strong. So let's see how we can do that. So I have a question for you. Oh, before I do, before I ask ask you, I want to tell us talk talk about resilience. So what is resilience? It's our capacity to recover quickly from stress or difficult situations. It's our muscle that can be strengthened to be able to do that, so that we can respond gracefully. So if you just think of a stress ball, for example, you apply pressure on the stress ball and squeeze it, you know how it deforms? And then we, when we release it, and you release that pressure, the stress ball comes back to its original shape. And so what we need to do is to help support our brain 3.0 pattern or prefrontal cortex muscles to uh, treat it similar like we would do a stress ball uh, and, and kind of build the resilience to build up that muscle. And doing this will allow us to respond to stress and anxiety with grace and skill instead of being reactionary and then further leading to burnout. So my question to you is, what are your go-to responses to stress and anxiety? How do you cope?
beautiful, lovely mechanisms of coping with stress. All wonderful meditation is uh, is high on here, and many of us also kind of uh, maybe maybe go to food or binge watching or uh, kind of. Uh, taking taking some of the things that might not be good for us too far. And there's rest, lots of exercise, doing something social, talking to a friend. I see breathing, <laughs> not procrastinating sleep. Yes, walking with my dog and walking my dog. I think so many of us um, coped with uh, anxiety and burnout during the pandemic by actually having a pet. Nice. Very nice, thank you. Comedy, laughter, puppies. Awesome, taking a walk, beautiful. I tried different things. I was desperate to get back on track and I kept telling myself, back on the saddle Anjali, no time to waste. And I started feeling this way, you know? So I went and got like blood tests, supplements, uh, after a little bit of like realization that I have to absolutely have to, and I saw a therapist because until then I was like, no, no, I don't need a therapist. But I realized I might need that. Sleep aids, a month sabbatical. Uh, I also did some binging on social media, Netflix. Uh, I took walks, yoga, meditation. And all of them helped. But in hindsight, I realized a few things that I have uh, put together in what I call a three R strategy for building resilience. Recognize, recognize what is actually happening so that you can start to sense it early as you are getting stressed. Recover is basically getting better from that, from that stress, getting back into shape and then rejuvenate regaining and maintaining your strength, your muscle for resilience. You can think of it like building muscles in, in a gym, kind of do something similar. Now, if you're in burnout, you have to think it's more like recovering from an injury. And the second stage of recovery takes a lot longer. So very first step, recognize. And recognize is about building awareness sensing what is coming when it's coming on so you can catch it earlier and earlier. So let's see <clears throat> what we can do in this stage. So one thing is to just notice what is happening. And this could be, uh, you can, you can, you can um, journal about it, or you can use a, a log like this. Uh, for me, I was asking these questions of myself. So here's an example of what a log might look like. Uh, so you want to see what was your primary brain pattern now that we have that shared language. Were you in 1.0, 2.0, 3.0 primarily? You can do it by day or by week. What were the situations that triggered that state? So just become aware of that. And how do you feel? How, do, how does it actually feel in your body? Because, you know, a body can sense something much before, much uh, before our thoughts develop around it. So if we can sense it in our body, we can catch it much early. So recognize what is that, what is those feelings? And then just ask yourself from that feeling, what do I really want? What do I want? Just log this for a while and notice the patterns. So here's an example. So I just put in here, we, and these are some, some actual situation that happened for me. So brain uh, in week, uh, 12, you know, 10, 12, 21, I was brain, in brain 1.0, I noticed that we got triggered when being invited to speak at a meetup. And the feeling that I had was fearful at first and then anxious and then overwhelmed. And what did I want? I wanted to just graciously decline. Making dinner was something that triggered me and that happened quite often. What? What were the feelings? Anger, let down, resentful. What did I want? Is just somebody to help me with dinner because I was feeling overwhelmed. So just kind of writing these down helps. Now, 
what helped me a lot is to be able to refine my understanding of emotion, have more words to express my emotion, because sometimes we just say, I'm angry or fearful, but what does that actually mean? And this emotion wheel helped me have more, a wider vocabulary for emotion. And when I was able to have a more precise word for what I was feeling, I could more clearly articulate what I want. And then actually, when I became more resourceful, to go ask for it. So I'm going to ask you to take a, a, a momentary pause and think about this past week. What was your primary par pattern this past week? And then to yourself, you can just think about what were you feeling? Well, thank you for sharing. This is just about awareness, no judgment, just note where you are at. And somebody mentioned other, and if you'd like to share what the other is, I think you'll uh, broaden our knowledge and, and understanding as well. So if anybody who put other, please let us know what, it, what do you mean by other? That was, so I put that one in and I think it's because I'm not probably one of those, it's somewhere in between some of those. Mm. Mm. Okay. I can define it as just one. Yeah. All right, just, just note where you're at and see if there's a pattern developing. The second step is recovery. So just like an injury, we have been diagnosed with something and if it is where we are we are in burnout or we are in high stress situation and it's triggered 1.0 or 2.0, we need to recover. So for this, we're gonna, I call it activating calm, calm. This is kind of the prescription to heal, if you will. So what can we do here? The first thing is to stimulate a parasympathetic nervous system. It's again, amazing that our body knows how to do these things and has mechanisms built in. And all we got to do is kind of trigger the right mechanisms. So the parasympathetic nervous system is a natural rest and digest system. And when stimulated, it relaxes our organs, the organs in our body. And you can trigger this by taking deep, one of the ways to trigger it is by taking deep abdominal breaths. So that's why for many of you who mentioned meditation and yoga and mindfulness and just breathing helps us really trigger this. And now we can, we can actually leverage our own body to help activate calm in our bodies. That's my little nephew in his yoga pose right there. Sometimes if uh, anxiety is like a high energy anxiety, actually stimulating the parasympathetic nervous system might not be accessible to us. We can't just go into that calm state. And in this case, we need to burn that restless energy in a healthy way. And to be able to dissipate that, we want to be able to do some activity that increases our heart rate. And this in fact, kind of helps dissipate those excessive stress hormones. This was a huge revelation to me that I needed to actually increase my heart rate because I was doing a lot of walking, I was doing a lot of yoga and I was still, the anxiety, I could still feel it in my body. And when I started doing some jogging, incorporating some jogging, it made all of the difference. And so now I, I can recognize that that may be some way that I need to stimulate uh, this, this activate calm. The next thing is, is to get, to slow down and get plenty of rest. And this is particular, particularly if you're already in burnout, this is really, really important. So when you notice stress and anxiety building, be kind to yourself. 
slow down and sleep is hugely, hugely important. I think it is, again, a built-in mechanism to be able to have higher resilience. Good sleep helps improve our brain function and our well-being, and our wellness. So seven to nine hours of sleep, if you can do that, uh, you'll be in good shape. And then last but not least, say yes to yourself. What was the biggest turning point for me is to surrender to that experience that I was having and not thinking of it as I need to uh, get rid of it. To really think about what is it trying to tell me and what was the experience I was being allowed to have, to be grateful for that. Uh, and in doing that and accepting what I was experiencing, <laughs> It changed everything in terms of me, me being able, like the turning point happened at that point in time. So some ways you can do this is to have, do a loving kindness meditation to yourself uh, and expressing positive things towards yourself. Daily affirmations. Um, make some kindness statements of who the amazing human being that you are and say it out loud to yourself. You, your ears, your heart needs to hear it from you. And then we don't need affirmation from, from outside. And then remember in, your, in the first uh, log that we said, like, what do you want? Listen to what your body is telling you about what you want and give that to yourself. Remove all the shoulds your body knows, your heart knows what you want and indulge yourself uh, once in a while or maybe more than once in a while. So that's about activating calm. The, the next stage is to rejuvenate. So now once you've recovered, once you're ready to get out of the hospital, if you will, now it's about growing those resilience muscles and getting, getting it to a strong state so that your response to stress and anxiety can be a sage response, a thoughtful response. So how do we do this? <clears throat> Strengthen your tend and befriend system. So this is something again in our world exhibited some, by some animals, including humans in response to a threat. We all kind of come together uh, and the, the social interactions that are comforting that actually help us decrease our stress levels. I say we don't heal in isolation, we heal in community. So the strength and befriend system, uh, you know, we probably see this happen during a natural disaster uh, or something, how our community comes together and supports each other. So why not nurture the system all the time? I cannot tell you, like here are two of my amazing, amazing friends, how they helped me restore my spark. So be intentional about spending time with your friends who bring care and positivity into your life. Do a lot of hugging. It says that people need 11 hugs a day. So get as many as you can. And sometimes it's just our dogs that can give it to us because nobody else does. So hug that dog. And then be kind and generous with your words, your deeds and actions, just expressing gratitude, doing something good for a, another person can help uh, elevate this tend and befriend system. And then now you can take your loving kindness uh, meditation and extend it to others as well. The exercise resourcefulness. So one of the things I told you is that in burnout, we become unresourceful. We cannot tap into our creativity and resourcefulness. So we need to build that muscle. And that muscle can be built by just stimulating our imagination and creativity. And it can be done in a fun and fun and engaging way. So to stimulate your imagination, play games, play board games, do puzzles, learn something new, read fiction. For your creativity, draw, play music, play an instrument, create a TikTok, if you will. I love Canva and I use that to kind of stimulate my creativity. And last but not least, at least from what I'm going to share with you today, is tap into flow. You'll probably recognize this. 
So one of the things that we need is some dopamine and serotonin, the positive hormones in our system. And for that, we need a sense of accomplishment. So, but when things get overwhelming, how do we address that? You know that big thing that you want to have or the intention that you want. Now break it up into small achievable goals, make progress visible, do a little bit at a time, celebrate the small wins and incorporate improvements. For us agilists in the room, this should be very familiar because I believe agile is a stress building, resilience building strategy. So use it, use it for us to be able to manage stress uh, and, and to be able to uh, uh, kind of build, build resilience to uncertainty, change, anxiety, et cetera. So from what you've heard, what is a new, what is a resilience building habit you are going to commit to? I hope that I gave you a few and if they're missing in your life, maybe you want to say yes to it. So I'm not sure, um, Angeli, something, it's not progressing the slide for us. On our oh, it end. isn't? Looks Let like it. Try again. How about now? Right. Yes, now it is. Thank you. Thank you for letting me know. Awesome. And then I suggest that if you commit to this, find an accountability partner to, uh, to support you in making that a habit. And for the little time that we have left, so you can continue to add to this. And what I'm going to do is share this deck with uh, Jamie so she can share it with all of you and you'll have access to all these commitments that people have made. And I'm going to quickly just summarize everything that we talked about. So triggers of stress are inevitable. Our brains have a built-in mechanism to protect us. But prolonged stress leads to a breakdown of that built-in mechanism. Our capacity to recover from stress is called resilience. It is a muscle that can be strengthened uh, with exercise, by exercising it. Use the three R strategy to build resilience. So re recognize, recover, rejuvenate, or build awareness, activate calm, grow your sage. In a world of constant change and uncertainty, don't wait for something bad to happen. Burnout is rife. It is also preventable, according to the state of burnout report. The practices to build resilience are so simple that we just talked about but they need to become a habit. And so hit refresh regularly. As a matter of fact, a few collaborators and I have started a bi-weekly, actually the first and third Wednesday of a month where we get to practice some of these resilience habits together in community. So join us, join us uh, and let's do this together. Here are some resources that I used the, the book, Calm Clarity, there's an amazing, amazing uh, course on Coursera called The Science of Wellbeing. Apparently it's the most popular course at Yale and you can get to take it for free. I highly, highly recommend and suggest that. The Emotion Wheel, uh, here's a link to it. And then the State of Agile Report will share uh, all of these resources with you. And connect with me. If you need someone to talk to, ping me. I hope that what I shared with you helps at least one of you. And thank you all for being here and for this opportunity. Thank you so much, Anjali. I think you will help more than just one of us. I, I, I certainly really appreciate your, your courageousness and your, your authenticity and, 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 your, and being brave and sharing um, your experience so that others can learn and, and learn from it as well. And I really, really loved your 
your poem. Thank you for sharing that. And You're welcome. Very, Thank very you. courageous. And it, it's so good to have you back at Scrum Masters of the Universe. Hopefully this meetup has a better experience in your mind than the first one. Oh, the, the other one did as, as well. I was just like, you can imagine uh, oh, yeah. not in the not in the best place, but <laughs> but uh, y'all are all amazing. And I hope that we can continue this conversation. I, I think I, for next year, I would like to think about how we go beyond the individual and bring some of this into our workplaces uh, and as for us as Scrum Masters and Agile coaches to, first of all, make sure that our cup is always full so that we can support other people in having their cups refilled regularly. Yes, indeed. All right, thank you all for joining us today. Um, appreciate you coming. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. And um, Anjali, thank you again so much. My, my pleasure, it. thank you. Thank you yep. for this opportunity. And uh, thank you, Mark, for your help on the tech support today. All right, everyone, have a wonderful rest of your day. Uh, we'll see you next time at Scrum Masters of the Universe. Bye, y'all. Bye, everyone. Bye.